Ladies and gentlemen, it's Spoiler in Time, the show that brings you the reviews of the shows we are able to watch because of the news that we bring you on Cord Killers. And uh, Peak Television is here. We have way more shows that we can deal with. We'll be spoiling in our library review, episode four of season six, Justified. And then the following new shows, episode four, season three of Leftovers, episode three, season three of Fargo, episode four, season three of Battle Carl Saul, episode two, season one of American Gods. I'm Tom Merritt. We will not talk about Guardians of the Galaxy till next week because this man, Brian Brushwood, made a promise to a few women. To a, to a, I, look, man, I make promises to ladies, and I make a promise to you. If you're new to Cord Killers and you just subscribed, and you're like, what is this thing? Cord Killers is the show where we talk about how to watch what you want, when you want, on whatever device you like. This is the show, the secondary show. But you didn't like my explanation? Uh, it was a little bit uh, cryptic. Yeah, no, it was not. It was yeah, perfect. It, it, I was cryptic. Cordkillers at gmail.com. Cryptid. Which explanation did you like better? You were a cryptid. You were, uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, you know what is I'm really cryptic is if people don't know what the the summer movie draft is DTNS is still in first place. Yeah, I have a strong feeling you're gonna stay there. Maybe not forever. Maybe uh, not forever. Um Fate ultimate. of the Furious above 207 finally makes me feel okay. My hopes rest on Wonder Woman. Fate of the Furious not getting to 200 million this week. Would have made me very worried. Would have been disastrous. Yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Fate of the Furious, if you end up uh, 220, 230 total, which I think you're going to drop off pretty quick because we saw a pretty significant slowdown on it right out of the gates. Um, Smurfs, obviously, not bringing in big money, but you still have Captain Underpants that that uh, the marketing looks pretty big, and that is a very successful, beloved property. It's uh, not going to bring in... It could overperform my $8 spending on it, but it's not going to bring in It's going to be one numbers, of the best yeah. buys. It's going to be upwards of $100 million, I think. Whereas Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2 brought you in $146 million this weekend, my friend. <sighs> yeah, unfortunately, not as much as I had wanted to see, uh, which is a, a, an obscene thing to say, but keep <laughs> No, in mind, but it is the... It was expected highest bet. gross of the year. Correct, correct. And we needed it to be 350 to 450. I think we'll be lucky if it breaks 300 uh, million. Yeah, we'll see. Uh, I think you have a good shot at 300. Uh, on sure. the me- on the on the flip side though, uh, I am seeing an awful lot of Pirates of the Caribbean marketing which makes me hopeful that maybe uh, which even is if your Guardians next movie yeah. underperforms, maybe that one will pull up the slack. But again, we, we did a very risky strategy by only having three movies in our draft, so I don't know. Coming up this weekend, King Arthur, Legend of the Sword, and Snatched. That's the comedy with Goldie Hawn and Amy Schumer. Yep. Uh, and both of those are Frog Pants movies, so they get the weekend, mm. basically. Good, good, good. Enjoy it. Enjoy it while you can. All right, let's move on. To Spoiling American Gods, episode two of season one, which uh, Brian and I were lucky enough to be able to watch together. Yeah. And uh, first of all, props to stars. I may have mentioned this last week for just making it available on Sunday. You don't have to wait until 6 p.m. or 9 p.m. in your time zone. It's just there. Yeah. And uh, it's a smart, smart move because they're aware that, uh, you know, it's not like there's going to be this culture of protecting spoilers or whatever. After all, it's based on a best selling book. And if you want to know how it ends. There's kind of a manual out there you could get that'll right. tell you. Um, I gotta tell you, uh, I this is a weird one for us to report on in that we are both corrupted. We're polluted by the knowledge of how the book goes, and it appears that they're working pretty hard to be faithful to uh, to aspects of the books that that matter. And in that regard, it's really hard for me to see it with fresh eyes. I'm burdened what, by what psychologists call the curse of knowledge. I can't unknow the things I know about machinations and who's who or whatever. I do re- so, so weirdly, the only way for me to comment on this episode is to talk about what I remember of it, of the book. And I remember uh, Shadow being a character so devoid of any reason to live that he's like, that that out of this stoic cynicism he's like yeah whatever i'll be your go-to guy for whatever you know yeah, it, yeah sure i'll play a checkers game and bet my life i on could it. kill myself matter? or i could just work for you i guess i'll work for you correct correct um the problem is within the confines of good storytelling on television you get into some weird artifacts like that checkers match because if he's so despondent and despairing that he he bets his life on a checker match 
for 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 an outcome that he doesn't even understand. He doesn't even know what it was, what it is. He wants uh, 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 Carl Hungus from uh, uh, from the Big Lebowski to right. do, but he's like, yeah, I'll bet my life, whatever. You can do that, but then it makes it weird for you to show a bunch of you know sweaty eyed tension as he plays a game of checkers, which also in, in, in uh, there aren't many high stakes checkers games in in literature, and I think it's because in general checkers is a fairly childlike silly game. Uh, but again, uh, culturally, I'm sure there's a reason that they did that. That just that whole scene read as a little bit like uh, okay, I guess this is happening to me. Uh, I'll tell you what I did like about that scene. I, I liked the characterizations of Cloris Leachman. Of uh, I'm trying to I'm tr- madly trying to find uh, Mr. Chernabog. Chernabog is is the guy with the uh, the hammer. Carl uh, Hungus. He's going to be Carl. He's Hungus not. Forever. He's the, he's Carl yeah, Chernab- Cardinal Chernabog Carl. Hungus. Yep. Uh, I I I liked that presentation of these old gods. Uh, in their broken down apartment in Chicago, it ties into, you know, there's a lot of Eastern European culture in Chicago that runs very deep. Uh, Polish communities, Ukrainian communities, Serbian communities, Czech communities, whatever. Uh, and so I, I really liked the characterizations. I liked the setting. Uh, but I don't, again... I had a slightly different reaction than you. I didn't have a problem with checkers. I didn't have a problem with the tension of the game. Even if he didn't care about winning or not, there would still be tension. There's a little pride on the line could explain it. But I'm with you at the base of, I don't feel the desperation from Shadow that I should. And I know they're trying to do it by having him dream about his wife uh, and show that agony. But, and again, maybe it's because I that curse of knowledge that you're talking about. I'm not feeling it at the level that I would like to, but I'm loving the way this show looks. I'm loving the characters. Uh, Ian McShane is insane as Mr. Wednesday. So I'm still having a very good time watching it. Uh, I also like the, um, under the control of Mr. Wednesday, uh, these these intentional structural methods to keep them in uh, the patois of, of, of the traveling con man. Uh, uh, there's a lot that doesn't work in an age of cell phones and of interconnectivity. Uh, and so that moment he's like, Oh, I got you a burner. So you can call me. He's like, screw your phone, screw this burner phone, screw what, no, don't use the highways. Yeah. We're going to use the back roads and all that. Like, even though that's obviously him sculpting the direction and the method of stuff to go, I think that's where it belongs. One of the other things, and forgive me, I'm going to make a comparison to the book. Um, very early in the book, you see an awful lot of Wednesday as a con man grifter. You see actual old school cons performed so that you understand, you get into that paper moon rhythm of everything. I don't know if they're holding off on all that because they feel like they've got a lot of seasons to get through or what, but I would have liked to have seen more, more of it. Yeah. yeah, I mean, they're doing it. And maybe they just felt like eh, it would take up too much a percentage of the episode if we do too much. And in, like, in, in fact, I'm going to say like on balancing the scales, I think you could trade all of the fully erect male phalluses that I saw and trade those for con games uh, expertly executed, and I would be happier. Okay. Well, that's a personal choice. Though. Well, I, I mean, again, it's just not everybody's going to make the same choice, but I that's just, fair. Look, that's I mean, fair. It's a dear price to pay, but I'm willing to pay it to get more of what I really want to see from Wednesday. I like you being upright about that. I mean, forthright about that. Um, no, I, it's I, just I, this outpouring of, <laughs> of, of frustration that I have. I want to talk about Jillian Anderson as Lucy, too, because when he meets, she's the god media which you would only know by looking at IMDb, but when he goes into the store How to do did some I shopping. That, that was Jillian Anderson. Eileen even said it. Well, I heard her say a name, but I was dialed in. But you were so in. dialed in. I was in. dialed in. Because she freaking looks like Lucille Ball. It's amazing. Yeah. It's amazing. Uh, and, and that whole scene where she's, you know, trying to uh, get. This is a nicer version of the tech guy we saw last time, which I, I felt was a little bit confusing. This one was very straightforward. Like, Hey, I'm television. Right. And I'm trying to get you over to our side. You met that tech boy. He's a, he's a mess. Trust me, shadow. Well, and in one of the things I would like very, very much to see, and, and I know they explained this to us in the book, but I've already forgotten it. I would like very much to know what makes shadow so special 
that 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 uh, I, I think is fairly apparent by this point that we are seeing uh, we're seeing Wednesday court many old gods yeah. who are down on their luck, who are, are not popular in and of the moment uh, to to uh, uh, do something, whatever it is, against these new gods, uh, the worship of the at the altar of technology and and, and of, um, you know, media as it's presented and so on. Um, I will say, I will say, and we, we spoke about this over lunch yesterday, um, I, I don't see what the significance of a repeat of uh, the woman who eats men between her legs. Oh, Bill Quist, yeah. Bill Quist. Like, I don't know that anything about that was terribly necessary. On the one hand, I liked it because it showed me, oh, it's not about middle-aged white guys like it was last week. It can be anybody. She just feeds off sexual energy. And it it sort of it made it less of a appointed social commentary and more of a, like, this is just a god who needs sexual energy. She doesn't care where she gets it. Sure. On the other hand... Other than that, it didn't... Like, I already... I mean, we got to see her go to the museum that, and right? we're like, oh, she's a god. We already know that, but the viewer doesn't, that needs to know that. There's not much else going on there yet. And, and you could uh, now understand that the movie or the television show could be different from the book. Uh, it could be that they are showing her loneliness and despair and her willingness to seek uh, to join something bigger than herself to have a chance to reclaim her yeah, yeah. glory or whatever. But, but again, but, but if they do that and, and that would be interesting if they do, that'll be an element that wasn't in the books. That'll be there. And I'm sorry, well, we're going to acknowledge that the books exist. Oh, and Orlando Bloom, uh, as, um, uh, what's his face? Uh, the uh, spider uh, God. Uh, uh, and uh, sorry. Uh, and, uh, wait, a Nancy, a Nancy, a Nancy boys. How could I not forget? Yeah, yeah. How could I, how could I, remember? uh, yeah. Uh, I, 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 in, in the books, he was a very jolly jaunty fellow, but he's tapping into a different gestalt. Here he's still laughing, but his eyes aren't laughing. You yeah, know what I mean? yeah, yeah. I took that as this vignette is about the beginning of slavery, and he's not going to be too happy about that. But right. may, but I bet we'll see him again, and he'll be a little bit more of that trickster god. Yeah, that's I, my expectation anyway. I I agree, but but regardless, expertly performed. Like, you know, this idea of just like, no, you're already dead. Yeah, burn this ship down. Mm-hmm. It's like. Why not? Let's go. Yeah. Talk about woke. Jeez. Uh, All right. Better Call Saul. Episode four of season three. Uh, I. What was this episode about again? Uh, This is the one that I'm sorry. Oh, right. I'm distracted. Because because we talked about it earlier this week when you were here. I started to forget which was the show and which was this. This is the one where they they go to the arbitration and agree to the the pre-prosecution agreement. He seems to take the deal. Uh, but, and, and he even turns and apologizes to his brother. Oh, and, and she makes him look him in the eye and say it to him. Let's, yes. Yeah. And, and he, has, he, he appears to have no problem doing that. By the way, the chat room is going nuts, uh, pointing out that it's Orlando Jones, not Orlando Bloom. Did I say Although Bloom? I'm Orlando sorry. Bloom would be a very interesting choice. <laughs> yeah, Orlando Bloom would not make a, a, a good... Yeah, maybe you'd make an amazing Nancy, one. I don't know. <laughs> Who's to say? Uh, but, um, uh, so it, by the end of the arbitration, it's very clear that uh, that Jimmy knows the next move. He sees that all of this is headed towards his ability to, uh, you know, he's going he's to plead on felonies so that they could take felony to the bar to get him disbarred. And that's, that's, what, his, that's what Chuck sincerely wants. Um, the, there is that moment at the end, though, where she says, cut the crap, we know there's a copy. And uh, and uh, uh, HMM, uh, not not Charles, but the other guy. Um, yeah, uh, Blondie. I want to make him Blondie McShooty face. We'll, we'll call him that. Blondie McLawyer face. Blondie McLawyer face is is like this is not how we do discovery, Kim. Uh, and and then but but Chuck can't. Kim, this is not how we do discovery. That's right. And uh, <laughs> meanwhile, Chuck can't help himself. He's like, yes, of course, there's another tape or whatever. And we don't know why, but we know that is significant. We know that that they got them by the balls where they want them. Yeah, they are very happy about that admission. Correct. And the only thing left is for Jimmy to be disbarred. And that seems like a foregone conclusion. He just admitted to this horrible stuff, which doesn't have to be proven in a court of law for the Bar Association's lower level of, of, of evidence right. to say, we don't feel like it is appropriate for you to be a lawyer anymore. Uh, 
And so my only guess is they're going to try to use that to keep him uh, a licensed lawyer. Yeah, or or they're going to go very hard on the offensive because it seems like Kim's upset enough that she might be up for some Jim and McGill style shenanigans in a way that she's yeah. not expressed before. And and by the way, the more I'm watching, the more I'm tripling down, I'm quadrupling down on my prediction. Kim is not, they're not a will they, won't they. They're not a Sam and Diane. They full on fall in love. And it's when she dies that he becomes the heartless, soulless ghoul that we have come to love as Saul Goodman. I think you're right about that. I'm kind of choked up. <laughs> <laughs> about that coming out. Uh, hey, let's talk about uh, let's talk about uh, Breaking Earth Bad, Earth the Child. Breaking Bad episode that happened. Uh, yeah, right. The rest of it was just a straight up episode of Breaking Bad. So, so we have he was successful in disrupting Hector Salamanca's uh, supply chain, right? Right. And Fring comes to him and basically says, "You can't do this, but I don't mind if you do that." Right. Right. Well, and and he does that, right? But then uh, uh, this is the episode where. After successfully dis- disrupting the supply chain, uh, dude comes in, throws a, uh, a brick of money at him, and he throws it right back. Uh, 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 Trout is not somebody who likes owing anybody anything. No, sir He yeah. does what he wants for his own reasons. Uh, and yeah. also, we see, uh, we see Ding Ding Man, uh, is what he will be eventually. H- Hector Salamanca. Hector Salamanca yeah. uh, walks confidently into Los Poyos Hermanos. Yeah, which, which by the way... And call out Fring. That is a tough thing for him to cover up in such a believably plausible, white-collar, non, uh, uh, non-drug-related non way, and yet he does it. And number one, it was great to see Nacho again. Uh, uh, the, more, the more of him I see, uh, Mondo... What's his last name... Uh, Michael, uh, whatever. Yeah, he's great. Uh, Nacho is great. Um, but uh, he comes up with a plausible enough scenario saying like, look, man, these guys intimidated me in my previous restaurant. Looks like they're trying to now. I, I really apologize. I'm going to make things right. I'm going to stand up for you. We are going to fight uh, uh, Michael Mondo. That's this guy's name. Um, and uh, he, uh, uh, he uh, damned if he didn't pull it off. It was great. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- I got nothing else to say about this episode except I liked it. And I'm liking this season probably more than the other two. Yeah. Uh, what yeah, about agree. what about the scene with um, uh, uh, Mike fixing the door, as Jackie Hearn reminds us? That's oh, it. yeah. Uh, 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 that's all tied into the mystery of what their game oh, plan right, is. Oh, right, because we get to see Mike and Chuck meet. Right. Well, and uh, uh, so so Mike shows up to fix the door for Chuck and, and uses the drill to scare Chuck off while he takes pictures. And they're obviously doing something with it. But again, this is... Well, that's another example of her getting her fingers dirty by calling and canceling the actual door repairman. Oh, sure, sure. Well, again, this is is why uh, Kim Kim and Jimmy, it turns out they were meant for each other and, and... it's it's good. Uh, as as the great poet Homer J. Simpson once said, it started off like Romeo and Juliet, but it ended in tragedy. <laughs> I have a feeling that that's where it's going to go. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks, Bryce. That That's an essential bit of this episode. All right. On Fargo, season three, episode three, uh, kind of a vignette episode as we see Carrie Coon's character head out to Los Angeles without permission uh, to investigate some leads regarding the death of her step grandfather, and we also get flashbacks of that grandfather's story. In fact, that's how the episode starts. We get to see a little 1970s LA and vignettes about him being led on by a producer to give money to create a movie that never gets made. Also led on by the woman who is supposedly going to star, gets pulled into doing drugs and and losing all the money and becomes bankrupt and gets angry and puts the producer, Harry Zimmerman, Harry Zimmerman, Zimmerman, something Zimmerman, into the hospital. Uh, you might have gotten ahead of where I was. I only made it as far as Carrie Coon's character uh, at the bar doing some nosing around, and then Mac from Always Sunny in Philadelphia shows up. <laughs> right. I didn't actually recognize him when he comes to the scene the first time, when oh, she really? first gets her bag stolen. I'm like, who is that guy? 
But then when he shows up in the bar, yeah. for some reason, being, in a, being bar, in a bar, I was also, like, oh, with, with, it's, his, with his with his Mac arm, yes, exactly. Displayed. I was like, oh, it's <laughs> Mac. Gonna, he's gonna get laid. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then uh, and then Leland Palmer from Twin Peaks happens to also be at the bar, who she sat by uh, on the airplane. Oh, that's amazing. So uh, I can't speak. I may be wrong in this supposition. So I'm technically only two and a half episodes. I haven't finished this episodes, but it seems like. Is it fair to say that this season of Fargo in some way at this point is lighter than the previous seasons? Maybe. Because we haven't seen... Because they're... Only because those first two are so deep and so dark. So brutal. Yeah. And, and so, you know, we see a housewives killed right. and we see we see murders to cover up murders. Because this is... I mean, it, I would not normally call a story about a man who is bankrupted by, by Hollywood uh, drug addicts uh, and has his life ruined to the point that he has to flee the state and change his name light... But, but relatively speaking, that's what I'm saying. Like, there's a lot of less blood in that story. This is a season about a a grumpy old man who dies and the stepdaughter who finds out who he really was. Yeah, it's kind of charming. Now, granted, we do have the looming terror of 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 you know the the the, the folks muscling in yeah. on the. We haven't seen their empire. gory side yet. Correct. Yeah. Correct. And I'm sure that will come. But but there's some part of me that's enjoying. Like Bonnie got straight turned up, uh, turned off of the first season of Fargo very, very quickly. Too bloody, too visceral, too, too brutal, mm-hmm. um, uh, and and she couldn't buy into it. If I gotta tell you, I'm not hungering for that brutality. And if they kept it at this lightness, the rest of it, I think I'd enjoy it a lot. But but I mean, I know that their brand is great storytelling, and I love whatever they do. But I just find it refreshing and and surprising that. <laughs> The fair is so light so far. Yeah. And so the, the part that you missed is she goes to visit Zimmerman, the producer guy in the hospital or in the nursing home. Uh, and he basically denies having known uh, her grandfather at first uh, and then just kind of tells her to, to, to piss off, gives her a part of the story. And then the woman at the diner, who is the older version of the actress from the, the flashbacks, ends up calling her and pulls her in and tells her the story of how her grandfather showed up, found Zimmerman at her apartment, realized what was going on, was out of money. Mm -hmm. And Zimmerman basically just told him like, yeah, kid, this is what happens. You know, you learned a hard lesson, but now you're stronger for it. And her grandfather, young and impetuous and angry, beats the crap out of him and puts him in that nursing home in 1975. Wow. And he's because they say he's been here a long time when you first see him. Okay. All right. Right on. Well, I, I look forward to seeing all that. Uh, to the leftovers, episode four, season three. Uh, we're in Australia. And we've had like single character episodes up to this point. This is a dual character episode of Kevin and Nora uh, in Sydney. I found this utterly charming and adorable. Kevin and Nora are built for each other. They are twins of desperation and their relationship works because they're both broken and they don't ask each other. They're not trying to fix each other at all. And that's something you so rarely see in television. If you do see two broken characters, it almost always is a morality play. You know, you, you think of train spotting or a relationship like that. Where it's just like, well, you're all broken, and now you all end in despair. But we're not seeing that with uh, with Nora and Kevin. Um, I think it was. I I thought it was a fascinating twist that the most morally bankrupt of our lo- lovable group of cast of characters is the one that brings Kevin back from the edge. Uh, uh, oh, his and his ex-wife, ex-wife yeah. Right? Um, because she's I, running a grift a, while a she's helping him on the grift, phone. A yeah. full-on grift, right? And keeping it uh, uh, from from her new husband to keep him from despairing or whatever. There, there, there is just a strangeness to this family. And, and they are a family, uh, uh, literally, now that they're all cross-pollinating with each other. Um, uh, that I just adore. And on top of that, the saccharine veneer of morning daytime television just wonderful and the fact that that MacGuffin of, of he thinks he sees heavy runs out there looks for her and then that ends up being the practical reason as if you know because again that's one of the 
the seductive possibilities is that this is all God's plan in some way. The idea that he was tricked into seeing Evie just for the purpose of bringing him there on camera so that, so his, that dad, his dad, Kevin sees Garvey, him. sees him. And, and yeah. it, it, it was just... Because up, up until that point, I was like, okay, so this is a departure from... Well, departure, huh? This is a, a, a departure from what we usually get, which is a mystical thing happens that should mean you're crazy, but there's a, a mystical explanation that means you're not crazy. This was not a mystical explanation. He just was seeing things. Yes. But then all of a sudden... Kevin Sr. seeing him makes like, oh, or was he? Yes, 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 yes. Uh, uh, which, which again, I, I can't explain what it is about that show that, that, that keeps seducing me. And, and I'll freely admit to anybody trying to watch it, the, the whole first season is about grief. And it's not fun to get through. And if you want to skip it, go ahead. But there's just enough joy and strangeness and and what a mixed up world we live in in seasons two and uh, I, I'm happy to say three episodes in and seasons so three far, as well yeah. that that I'm just loving it and the it is so human and and this is maybe where we disagree uh, I understand that the leftovers has the advantage of being a story that we've invested you know two plus years of our lives to get to this point but I feel a humanity and a connection to the characters and the situations in The Leftovers that I am not feeling in American Gods. And part of that is by design because American Gods... Because it's about gods. Well, okay. (laughs) Well, but but also there's a lot of mystery in American Gods. There's a lot of like, well, why are they doing this in American Gods? Uh, that, That does get satisfyingly, that itch gets scratched later. Whereas... Uh, weirdly, the leftovers will never scratch the itch. I'll never know why, and I'm I'm comfortable with this. I, yeah. you know, let the mystery be. Let's right. talk about Nora's uh, side of this mystery too, where you know we've been wondering: is she really trying to catch these guys, or does she just want to find out what's actually happening? Uh, and we don't really get to find out how far she would have taken it because she goes through the whole procedure, and at the point where she's like, "So you want my money, right?" Because Either she's excited to try it and see if she can be reunited with the kids or she's excited to bust them. They ask her a question and the answer she gives is apparently not satisfactory and they just leave on her. I am convinced. Uh, And of course, there's another thing we'll never know. And that's the beauty of the leftovers. We'll never know if there was a right answer to that question. uh, A big part of me strongly suspects that that no matter what she said, they were going to get up and turn and leave. Uh, might be, you know, like, uh, and we'll never know if the, the holding the baby for the bus situation was a manufactured thing or not. I, I feel like you could be right because why would they put her through all the medical tests first and then ask her the question? Wouldn't you ask the question first? And then if it's like, oh, you passed that. Okay, now let's do the medical test, right? I mean, why waste the time and money on it? Well, first of all, if if it's not a real procedure, if it's not a real magic black box, then all bets are off. You do anything in whatever order you want to torture them in whatever way you and want. And you also take their money. Yeah, uh, maybe. You know what? As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, it is, it is a common uh, ploy for con men to refuse the original sum and and only after they offer even more. Well, and Nora says it. that is like, is that what's going on? And they they're like, no, don't contact us again. And, and they, you know, they basically try to discount that that's the complaint. Now, maybe they'll change their mind and come back later and ask for more money. Well, and, and, but and I can easily posit in my mind in a world where we're seeing so many cults, what they want to see is the kind of person with the level of dedication where uh, they get told you're not going to go be with them. But instead, you're going to give us five years of service under a different face. We're going to alter your face. We're going to give you a new identity. Mm-hmm. You're going to go underground and do blah, 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 blah. You're in the cult now. And and so, may, you know, maybe whatever the pre-interview said that, well, she's obviously not the right person for this thing. And then they change. Yeah. Well, and we also know that she gets old in Australia somehow. So we don't know how we're getting there. Mm. Uh, She obviously sticks around. Maybe she does join later on. And that's why she's still there doing that undercover thing. You know, and also we don't know if when she said, I don't know a Kevin Garvey, if that was a rejection of the guy and the relationship we know or... For all we know, you know, maybe maybe she gets into a magic box and has a stroke and a mind wipe or whatever. Or, you know, there's a million different things. Yeah, yeah. That can happen. All right. Shall we finish with Justified? 
Who Ep- boy? Episode I, four, season six. I assume some other stuff happened, but I do know that through time and space, Jake Busey shows up to blow up in front of a uh, safe. Little, little comedic, to be honest, that uh, whole I'm thing. I'm sorry, you're mispronouncing silly. Silly <laughs> is the word you're looking for. Uh, it was it, the blood spatter. It was silly. It's, it's one thing to have the cell phone go off and he's the idiot who's been so bravado and he forgot to turn off the cell phone and that kills him. It was it was the the blood splatter with the goof, stoic, goofy look, yeah. With the stoic like, wah, wah. Burn, yeah. It was only missing the horn. It's blast. a living. Yeah. <laughs> oh well. Um, but uh, I I honestly don't even remember what else happened, and I can see you're looking up show notes because you don't remember. Ava's either. in the hotel. <laughs> All right. Right. Yeah. And uh, and Catherine wants to get lunch with her. Oh, that's right. And uh, takes she, her she shopping. Ends up chatting, yeah, yeah. With uh, again, Mary Steenburgen, the shining, shining star of this whole season. Totally, everything she does, she's fantastic. Uh, Raylan and Tim go check in with Calhoun from Friday Night Lights about uh, who's buying up what. Try to put the pressure on him. Uh, they start noting the number of fires and carbon monoxide deaths among people who refuse to sell, uh, and they visit Dicky Bennett in prison for some reason. Yeah, that didn't... I really expected that to do literally anything outside of just show us Dickie Bennett again. All it does is show us Dickie Bennett because they could have just found out that Loretta owned the house. Because the ostensible reason is he says, no, I sold it to Loretta McCready. And then they go find Loretta living her drug dealing lifestyle. But th- but this is also the kind of move you see in a final season is let's take a let's grand give Dickie one more. And- but didn't we already get a bow from Dickie earlier this we did, season? We did, but it's but that not this season. Now it's this season. Oh, it was last we, season. Yeah, okay. we have to we have, right, to, we have right. to, you know, soar over like look at this land filled with Dickie Bennett's and Loretta's and 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 uh, Ava's. Well, Boy. and uh Ty Walker is making her an offer. Uh Ty calls in Avery, so we get to see uh Sam Elliott and Raylan Givens chair scene. Yeah. Uh, dude. Uh, Those Sam are Elliot some just steely choose, eyed people in that. Choose the scenery, man. Nom, 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 nom. Uh, it's, it's good. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm just stuck on, on exploding Jake Busey. Yeah. Um, other than that, better. it's a strong episode. That's uh, 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 Jake Busey, pretty much the king of uh, exploding. He exploded on contact. Uh, all right. He exploded on this. <laughs> Uh, he may he, he, may, he did he not may ha- explode in Starship Troopers. It might be in his writer. Uh, yeah, no. <laughs> Is mean, there a deleted scene from Starship Troopers where he exploded? Oh, no, he's definitely in that final scene cheering yeah, right, for the fine. fascists. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, there you go. That's justified. Uh, we're enjoying it. I'm enjoying season six quite a bit. Yes. No. Uh, much much better. I'm glad to see them step up their game. Everything we're watching right now, I'm really really happy with. It's been good. Thank you. You've been good, too. And that's why we do this show. Thank you so much for supporting us at Patreon.com slash Cord Killers. We'll spoil you next time. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. (laughs) 